You are listening to the ABC Business Show, where we help entrepreneurs make their dreams a reality. Here are your hosts, Kerry, Elise, and MJ. Disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the hosts and guests. The information provided in this podcast is for general informational purposes only and should not be considered as professional advice. Hello and welcome to the show. We are on podcast 69. Uh, My name is Kerry. I am joined by my co-hosts MJ and Elise. And today Elise is going to talk through basic internal controls. So I'm just going to say this because Elise said this. She knows this is a boring subject, but it's one that's, you know, when it's boring, it normally ends up being really important and really critical for your business. So (laughs) don't switch off. Stay listening. Uh, We're going to jump straight in and get started on this as Uh, I know there's going to be a lot to cover. So, uh, Elise, what is your quote for the day? Quote for the day is from Robert Kiyosaki. It's not how much money you make, but how much money you keep, how hard it works for you, and how many generations you keep it for. And so as a business owner, number one, that's what you've got to have there. Amen. I I like it. (laughs) I love it. So, Elise, let's start off with a brief explanation of what does internal control mean? Well, it has actually a finite definition. And generally, what it means is taking control of your environment, your assets, and the running of your business. That's just kind of in a nutshell what it does. But the definition is the mechanisms, rules, and procedures implemented by a company to ensure the integrity of financial and accounting information, promote accountability, and prevent fraud. So that is great because that explains why, you know, as you know, in accounting, we request documentation that we don't just go on words of you know, people saying, oh, my bank balance was this at this date. It's like, no, I want to see the statement. You know, I got to make sure those numbers are right. And we have to compare it to the bank statement, not just you telling us what the bank balance was. That's right. It's so funny how people assume we're just supposed to take their word for things. It's just not, doesn't happen that way. We use processes in accounting to ensure that the numbers that are on the piece of paper you're looking at are correct. So it's, um, you know, use standards. Yeah, I, I find in coaching that many business owners, they understand it's important. They're like, yeah, 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 I know it's important, but they don't always get the importance until something happens. Like, an employee and business money from them or big mistakes are made and the process wasn't there to avoid that. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. it's so sad that something has to happen to make a business owner start implementing some of these things. I think that, you know, there's just so much trust by that business owner because they're like, well, this wouldn't do that to me. And like, they like, me. like they, they love me that why would they do that? And I just think that, you know, it's it's something that people need to start being proactive about rather than being reactive. That is correct. And the biggest thing is, it's like we have been talking to our listeners about is putting in these standards, putting in these processes. Then it's like this is and then and the employees adopt the same accountability as a team, right? Mm-hmm. And so one doesn't really squirrel out and kind of get in the way. It says, yeah, he's kind of like really, really quiet or and you go, he's got too much control. Who knows? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that can happen. And what for me, the hardest thing, the most miserable thing for an employer, when they find out that their taxes have doubled because of an accounting error. No, I can't imagine that. Oh, it happens. It happens. And I always have to deliver the bad news, right? Um, you know, fraud, for instance, happens in treasury department all the time. Like for instance, a not-for-profit. One of the smallest cases I ever worked was a not-for-profit and they scratched their head, just like Carrie's talking about. I can't believe this guy would ever do this. Well, in fraud, it's getting down to the why. Why Mm -hmm. did they break their ethical or moral, you know, foundation? He's, you know, great person and all this kind of stuff. Well, later on, it was found out that he started taking drugs and literally just nobody was watching. He made the checks out to himself (laughs) and nobody accounted for it. No reconciliations, no nothing. The not-for-profit went down. So the why, you've got to get to the basic of the why, which is when you talk about communicating on a regular basis and employees having their own personal goals and you're aware of them you're going to get some little, you know, red flags from time to time, because what is it? 
There are three angles to fraud, motivation, opportunity, and Mm -hmm. rationalization. So motivation, I don't have money. I need money for drugs. Right. That's a big motivator. Opportunity. Oh, nobody's going to know if I do this because nobody counts. Mm -hmm. Nobody reconciles anything. And then rationalization is often a compromise. And you see that in a lot of governmental fraud. Nobody's watching me and they don't care about me. You know, you can just rationalize like mad dog. And it's like, you know, a lady, I think, um, you know, here in Florida was had taken $300,000 from the local government. And yeah. everybody thought she was marvelous and all this kind of stuff. So rationalization is a big deal. And then that's from the overview. From you as an owner's view, they have some kind of perceived pressure. It's just in their mind, you know, of course, we we know it can be other things as well. But then they see a perceived opportunity which control procedures and processes would usually pick those up. The purpose behind what we're going to talk about and how we're putting it together is to detect before it goes on too long that somebody's doing something that's not right and it's hurting the company. And so the last one is some way to rationalize fraud as not being inconsistent with their values. What do you mean by that? So inconsistent with their values. So in other words, I am worthy and they don't think I am. So, you know, a governmental employee that has some controls and can write, you know, some invoices and things like that and put them through the system because you undervalue me. Right. And it's just their values are inconsistent with their job duties and things like that. But it is kind of an irregular kind of thought process that happens. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So, Hopefully now our listeners are thinking like, okay, I need to get something in place. I need to you know, not wait until something happens. So how can they start this whole process? I'm just going to give a few basics. It can be very intricate. And as you build a control system, you know, the policies, procedures, and things like that, you'll start seeing the details and see how it works. So one of the things you want to have in place initially, organization structure, job descriptions, and an authorization process for purchases, spending money, keeping money, budgets, and things like that. So you can see how each of those three items, how they can be very deep and they can go really intricate and affect your business dramatically. The next thing is, number two, is segregation of duties. A lot of times this has to do with things that come close to your cash, the utilization of cash, the keeping of cash, timing and things like that. So you can think with that a little bit like, you know, when my cash comes in, who handles it? Who deposits? Who spends it? Are they the same people? Well, if they're the same people, they can write a check back and forth to each other, you know, same person. (laughs) And so the duties, we break them up so they cannot, hopefully no collusion. That's what you get in businesses is collusion between different people. Yeah, that's one thing I find, um, you know, when clients come on board, one client I had on one question I asked was who signs the checks at their um, office that's an hour and a half away from the main office. And the answer that I got was not the answer that I was expecting. And my jaw hit the desk. And it's like, we have a stamp with my signature on that they use. And I'm like, please get rid of that. Like, please don't do that. You know, it's one of those things, the fact that you can actually order these, you know, that this is not the only company that's doing this. So If you have a stamp that's your signature, so somebody else can sign checks on your behalf, please destroy it because it is not worth having that risk on your business. Because if that signature stamp gets into the wrong hands, you don't even want to think about the potential damage that that could cause. Um, And then another one we have is, and actually, I think it was the same company. So the same bookkeeper who was stamping the check with the signature was also reconciling the bank. So there was nobody else looking at this bank. Everything was just her eyes. And that's where things start to go wrong is when you, like you said, at least, you know, one person has got their hands in too many different areas and it all comes back to those checks and balances. And, and then I asked, you know, because, you know, something else we always talk about, Elise, is what's your approval process? I know Mm -hmm. when I worked for a general contractor, the invoices and pay applications would come to me. I had a stamp that I would put on and I'd fill out the information. And then that pile went to the owner. 
he would then approve them and it would go to the project manager as well. He would approve his, they would come back to me, I would enter them on. And then when they were ready to pay, they went back to the owner for him to sign them. So I wasn't approving or paying anything. I was deciding who would get paid, but they only got paid if the owner actually signed the check. So it's like, you know, yes, it was time consuming, but it protected me, you mm -hmm, know, so the mm -hmm. owner knew that I wasn't doing anything I shouldn't have been. It protected the owner from, you know, the same thing. And it was just that whole process. And, you know, like I mentioned before, I think some business owners are just too trusting. And yes. I think there's a balance because you don't want your employees to think like, geez, he doesn't even trust me. She doesn't trust me to do a thing. I can't even do this without her approval. But it's like, that's the system. That's the process that keeps everybody safe and everybody honest. So I think that is definitely an area when it comes to the bookkeeping, that people are too trusting and just take the shortcuts because it's easier, mm -hmm. but it's not in the long run. Yeah, I heard somebody say one time, that's tough, get used to it. So authorization and approval processes are big. And people that have worked in um, structured organizations that deal with inventories, you've got the guy that checks the receipt that comes in and verifies they received everything they were supposed to get. Then they verify it against the original order. And then they check with the manager if they found any things that are out. So they have these check by check by check by check thing because the company cannot afford to pay for something they didn't order. Right. So a lot of care goes in authorization and approval processes and construction is big on that. And they're big at controlling their cash because they deal with big numbers. So anyway, yeah. and then um, the fourth and the biggest deal for anyone to kind of look at and you have to do it carefully is monitoring processes Somebody has to be independent that does that. In other words, like Carrie was saying, the same person reconciles the bank that does all the checks and all that. It's like, no, no. And so by monitoring the processes, like for instance, you have an in internal auditors are in bigger companies and that's what they are literally doing. And then those processes get updated for any errors that are found or loopholes or, ooh, how did that get by the process that we had put together? And then you go in and you edit and, um, you know, and, and keep, this is done on a consistent basis. Yeah. There's really a cost to businesses for not having basic control systems in place. That's true. That's true. And I have a statistic on that too. And actually I was a little shocked, but not really. Okay. Right. Um, 30% of businesses that fail are caused by employee theft. Wow. Wow. Now the biggest case that I worked was 2.5 million taken by the one person. 2.5 million was skimmed right off of wow. the company. They recovered about 1.5 and there were absolutely zero ramifications to the person that worked for them for 10 what? years. What? Zero. So Can we ask why this, is that something you can't talk about? Well, about <laughs> once you're in business for a while and you're dealing in for some period of time and you've ever dealt with fraud, now you have to not only be an accounting person, you have to be a lawyer as well. Uh -huh. So the legal side of things are totally different from the accountability and things like that. But I'm just saying that this company could have survived a downturn, yeah. but barely, I mean, almost closed their doors because that 2.5 million, that business owner would have had that in the bank. That's the way he ran his company. Wow. And so it's 30%. That's a I lot. I thought you said this podcast was going to be boring at least. <laughs> well, I get excited about this kind of stuff because I like helping the business owners not get into this hot water. Yeah. And, you know, there's a way that you can check out some fraud schemes and some of them you look at and go, well, that's crazy. That's silly. They're wild. Yeah. Well, they happen, but you can Google fraud schemes. The IRS and here in the U S is now giving newsletters out on the latest fraud schemes having to do that's, with trying to take good. your ID and trying to take and trump up, you know, refunds and things like, you know, along those lines, but there are, they have their scams. They have their top 12, which modifies and changes all the time. But if you know what they are, you can work through on how to avoid them in your business. And like I said, it's just get tough and say, that's too bad. That's the way we do it. Lots of great information there. So close out, at least what is your tip for the week? 
Well, this is for the business owner. The business owners set the example from the top. So as you are setting an example for controlling the use of your assets, the spending of assets, and keeping assets. So if the business owner adopts a control system in their own way of running their business, and they are comfortable and good with it and know it's the right thing to do, then all of your team, the guys that work for you, properly coached, properly, you know, on a team, not just an employee, then you're going to be a much happier camper. Yeah, definitely. Right. Okay. So if you have not followed us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, go ahead and uh, give us a like and a follow. And if you haven't left us a review that yet, then we would love for you to go and do that. If you're enjoying listening to our podcast and if it's helping you, then leave us a review and same on our uh, ABC Business Show Facebook page. Go give us a like and a follow there as well. So join us next time when we will be talking about your chart of accounts, something that Some people go completely over the top and have a profit loss three pages long and some people that have it so short that they really can't see how their business is doing. So join us for that next time. And thanks for listening. Bye. You have been listening to the ABC Business Show with Kerry, Elise and MJ. Make sure you tune in next week.